Have you ever watched Pirates of the Caribbean and thought, this is funny, but what would make it even better is if the main character's name was Monkey? Have you ever watched Fantastic Four and thought, I wish Reed Richards had the personality of a golden retriever? Have you ever watched a hardcore military movie and thought, this is cool I guess, but what would make me take these marines really seriously is if they all wore flat caps with the word marine written on the forehead. If your answer to any or all of these questions is yes, then One Piece is the show for you. And if your answer to all these questions is no, then guess what? One Piece is still the show for you. Because I too would have answered no to all of these questions if you'd asked me a month ago. And honestly, if you'd tried to describe this show to me, I would have told you I had absolutely no interest. Sounds unique for sure, but just not my thing. Luckily, nobody told me anything about this show at all except that it was good. But everybody told me it was good, and when that happens, I cannot ignore it. The last time I saw this much hype surrounding a show, it was Arcane, and that was the best thing I'd seen in years, so naturally I had to see what everyone was talking about about this show. And did it live up to the hype? Absolutely. This is easily one of my top three favorite shows of the last few years, right up there with Arcane and House of the Dragon, and I absolutely cannot wait for season two. I'm actually so glad nobody tried to explain the show's premise to me before I watched it, because I think it's an almost impossible task to explain the show to anybody and actually do it justice, but I'm about to try anyway. If somebody had told me, well, it's a show about a really, really obnoxiously optimistic and happy character named Monkey D. Luffy, who can't swim but wants to find the famed treasure known as the One Piece, then become King of the Pirates, I would have been skeptical at best. And then if they'd followed up by telling me that he has stretchy powers, I would have probably lost all interest. It's just not a concept that sounds appealing to me. Yet somehow, it just worked. This show is the wackiest thing I can remember watching, to the point where it, almost everything is so absurd that it should be impossible to take it seriously. And yet, the times when the show requires it, you do take it seriously. Somehow, you manage to look past the anachronistic clothing and the ridiculous marine outfits and the outlandish superpowers and fantasy races. Somehow, you even manage to look past the fact that they communicate on talking snails that work like old-fashioned telephones. I'm not even kidding. <laughs> This is God. All that absurdity just becomes so commonplace in this show that you almost just tune it out and suddenly you find yourself really getting drawn into a story that is so over the top that it has no right to be as engaging as it is. This whole show is an enigma. From everything we've been told about film and TV, it should be impossible to make something so absurd yet so relatable and true at the same time. In my opinion, it mostly comes down to the characters. While their personalities are oftentimes very much larger than life, there is something about each of the main characters that just makes them so incredibly relatable, so understandable to the audience, while still remaining distinctively different to one another. Even the villains and side characters are better fleshed out and more insightfully written than the main characters of most recent pieces of media that I've watched. I'm looking at you, Ahsoka. Usopp's love interest, Kaya, has more depth and personality to her than any of the lead characters in Ahsoka, and she's basically only in a two-episode arc. So, why do I love this show so much? Because it's not just the characters, no matter how good they are. There's a lot more to love about the story and the world in which it's set. This show is one of the most refreshingly happy, optimistic, and wholesome shows that I've ever watched, which is just such a nice change from the, you know, so much of the modern media that tries to be grounded and realistic and ends up landing on cynical and depressing. And there's a place for dark, gritty, morally complex stories. You know, House of the Dragon is a perfect example of that. But it just feels like that's all we've had lately, and the, most shows fall short of the greatness of that Game of Thrones spin-off. What I'm trying to say is the market is flooded with bleak, depressing, supposedly morally grey shows, which has left a massive void in its wake. A void which One Piece perfectly fills with its cheerful optimism and simplistic good versus evil worldview. I didn't even know it was something that I needed until I watched this show, but now I just want more of the you know, genuinely positive wholesome content like this. Unfortunately, trying to get wholesome content out of Hollywood is like squeezing blood from a stone, which is part of what makes this show so special. It's such a rarity. Despite having a very simplistic view of morality, at least on the surface anyway, this show actually has multiple scenes which promote much deeper and much more commonly overlooked moral foundations than what Hollywood and society as a whole has shown recently. You know, we've strayed away from it. This show speaks to foundational truths that would almost never be addressed in any other modern media, and I'll get to examples of both in the spoiler section. On top of that, it also covers much more basic themes such as loyalty and friendship and the power of believing in those around you, and it handles those topics extremely well as well. This show understands gender roles and stereotypes, and it doesn't run from them or constantly challenge them. It knows when to lean into them and when to subvert them, because yes, there can be a time for subversion, believe it or not, but it never feels like it's trying to shove a political message down your throat, which is a welcome change from modern media. As far as I can see, the show is not remotely woke. 
It's not rife with identity politics, it's not constantly belittling its male heroes, it's not pushing Hollywood's usual anti-morality or inadvertently depicting its heroes as fundamentally unlikable, awful human beings. The closest thing I can think of to a woke part of this show is the fact that Morgan Davies, the actor who plays Luffy's friend Kobe, is transgender. But that's stretching so far for a non-existent woke agenda because the show never addresses it directly, it never makes a big deal of it or anything like that. Davies just plays the role like any other actor would. And I forgot to mention I've never watched or read any of the source material of this show that it's based off, since anime and manga just generally aren't really my thing, so I can't comment on how accurate the characters are to their original counterparts. But what I will say is this. I felt that the actors, all of them, including Morgan Davies, did a very good job of portraying their characters as I understood them. Still, I'm not going to lie, the first moment when I saw Kobe, the first thing that went through my mind was a quote from the recent Starfield rant video that went viral from Heel vs Babyface's livestream. Sorry, did you want to get immersed in our world? Yeah, well, guess what? Fucking gender ambiguity! Fucking current day Californian shit! Between Kobe and Alveda, I really thought this show was going to be ultra woke for about the first 10 minutes or so. But then I quickly realized this is just a very wacky world where every second character has, you know, unnaturally brightly colored hair and every pirate captain is more outlandish and ridiculous than the last one. Still, Kobe was probably one of my least favorite characters in this show, more due to his constant nervousness and extreme lack of confidence than anything else. He's definitely on a character arc towards overcoming those flaws though, and he has grown on me quite a lot throughout the season. But enough about the human of ambiguous gender, let's talk about the characters that I actually really liked. Monkey D. Luffy has got to be one of the most outrageous heroes I've ever seen, but it didn't take long before I was absolutely loving his character. He's just so infectiously positive and incorrigible in his efforts to form a crew and become a great pirate. I absolutely love the way he's just set on essentially taking back the word pirate and transforming it from something negative into something positive. And I really love how willing and ready he is to just help anybody in need at the drop of a hat. His powers are utterly absurd, his finisher moves should be the most cringy things imaginable, but somehow it all just inexplicably makes sense in this world and suits his character perfectly. Roronora Zoro is an absolute legend from the moment he first steps onto screen. I love how well he balances that dark, broody character with a kind of smartass whose mouth gets him into trouble a lot more than you would expect from a character who seems like he should be the strong silent type. I especially like his humility though, where he is willing to humble himself in order to help make others feel better. It's hard to explain that one without spoilers, so I'll get more into it later, but I'm referring to the scene in the bar where he first crosses paths with Axan Morgan's son. Nami is another excellent character who at first may just seem like a, you know, another generic strong female character, but you pretty quickly learn that there's so much more to her than just being a tough girl who can beat up the marines. I love that this show wasn't afraid to show her femininity. From her being one of the most empathetic of the crew, to her actually dressing like a woman. I know, right? Who would have thought that would be something praiseworthy? Dressing a woman like a woman? But in modern Hollywood, it's far too uncommon. I like that they very much leaned into her femininity with her outfits without taking it too far and overly sexualizing her. Her motivations and her hatred for pirates contrasts really well with Luffy's insistence that pirates don't have to be bad. Again, not a character I can say much about without spoilers, but I absolutely loved her story arc. She's probably one of my favorite characters of the show. Usopp I found really quite annoying. He's portrayed fine, he's written fine, it's just a personal thing. He just irritates me so much with his tall stories and his constant crying wolf and you know stealing the spotlight from people who actually earned it. Probably because I've known too many people like that in real life, and while it may be an interesting quirk to give an anime character, it's not an easy trait to deal with in the real world. Sanji wasn't in it a whole lot, and I don't have any deep insights into his character, but I really did enjoy him, and I'm keen to see more of him in the future. I absolutely loved his backstory with the themes of sacrifice and fatherhood, even though the old man was not his father. And that's something that this show does excellently. It depicts good, strong, positive masculine role models. Shanks, Luffy's mentor and idol, is a perfect example of this. He might actually be my favorite character in the show because of how incredibly well he portrayed true masculine strength. He knows how to fight, and he will fight to protect those he cares about, but he also knows when not to fight, and he's willing to suffer a lot of disrespect and personal attacks without drawing his sword. He has almost a servant mentality, which is just something I've not seen in almost any media outside the Bible. I absolutely love it. Now, I'm not going to go into depth on the rest of the characters, but there is a lot of great ones. Garp is awesome, Bucky the Clown is hilarious, Mihawk is super cool, and Arlong is a surprisingly intimidating villain. I never thought I'd see the day where a man with a swordfish nose could actually be a scary villain, but the actor did such an excellent job, especially with the voice, and the show really just nailed it all around. He fits perfectly with the absurdity of the world while still remaining sufficiently threatening. So I think I would give this show a 9 out of 10, honestly. The only reason it's not a 10 for me is because it didn't really catch me or hook me as quickly as I think a show like this should. That's maybe my one complaint. It took me about to the third or fourth episode to really get hooked on the show. After episode two, I thought, okay, it's interesting enough to keep watching, but I wasn't super hyped on it. 
It was really episodes three and four that got me fully invested. Now moving into spoilers, and I won't review the whole show in depth, I just wanted to talk about a few specific scenes that I felt stood out the most for various reasons. The first thing I wanted to talk about is the way that this show places such an uncommon emphasis on humility and servitude amongst its heroic characters. You just don't see that in modern media, but there are two scenes in this show in particular where it really stood out to me. The first is the lesser of the two, and it's the scene where Luffy first sees Zoro. Zoro has entered an eating establishment to get a drink, and this young girl, possibly the owner's daughter I think, offers him some food that she's made. It's her own special recipe, rice balls coated in chocolate. And someone who actually likes chocolate will have to tell me whether or not that sounds as awful to you as it does to me. Personally, I cannot stand the taste of chocolate at the best of times, so that meal just sounds absolutely awful. But Zoro is more than happy to give it a try because he knows it will mean a lot to the girl. Right then, she bumps into this guy who I'm just going to call Captain Nepotism since he's the son of Axehan Morgan, the leader of the local marine garrison. Captain Nepotism knocks the food on the ground and then has a go at the girl for not, you know, looking where she's going or something stupid. But Zoro, Zoro is just not having it. He can see how upset the girl is, and instead of simply demanding an apology from nepotism, he does something completely unexpected. Something most people would be far too ashamed to do. He gets down on the ground and scrapes some of the girl's food off the floor, then he eats it, complimenting her cooking. You can see just how much it means to her in the way she responds, and this scene instantly made me just love this character. Zoro, the most famous pirate hunter in the East Blue, a legendary swordsman, is not too proud to literally get down and eat food off the floor in front of everyone just to make this little girl feel better. That level of humility and servitude is actually beautiful, and I wish we saw more of that in modern media. Of course, I also love the way Zoro then tells Captain Nepotism to try some, which leads to a fight in which Zoro absolutely schools all these idiotic marines without even drawing his blade. But the second, more notable example of humility and servitude is in Luffy's flashback scenes with his mentor character Shanks. Shanks is a pirate captain, and he and his small pirate crew are celebrating at a dockside bar drinking and having a good time. Another pirate crew shows up and the other pirate captain demands drinks for himself and his crew, but Shanks crew have drunk the place dry. In an effort to remedy the situation, Shanks offers the other captain the last half bottle, but the captain takes offense because he wants more. He pours the alcohol on Shanks and smashes the bottle on the ground, and then there's this tense moment where it looks like there's going to be a fight. And Shanks asks the barmaid for a mop. Even at this point, I was still fully expecting and looking forward to seeing Shanks take the mop and beat the guy up with it to, you know, teach him a lesson. Clearly young Luffy wanted him to do that too, but instead, Shanks takes the mop and simply starts cleaning up the spilled liquor and broken glass, choosing to act as a servant instead of a warrior. And I was astounded. As I said, this is so uncommon in modern movies that it just took me by complete surprise, but I loved it. I love the way he diffused the situation without having to resort to violence. I love the way him and his whole crew just like sort of laughed it off and they're like, yeah, he got you, Captain, because they all also understand that a spilled drink and a bruised ego is just not worth bloodshed. And I love that even when Luffy calls Shanks a coward for not standing up to the other pirate captain, Shanks doesn't get defensive or angry. He just sighs and tells Luffy that this is proof that Luffy is not ready to join his crew. Another thing I love is that he didn't make the barmaid clean up the mess, even though it's probably technically her job. He took it upon himself to do it because he has that servant attitude that I mentioned earlier. And as I said earlier, the only place I can even remember seeing anything remotely similar to this is in the Bible when Jesus washes his disciples' feet or does any number of other acts of service and just generally doesn't behave in a way that everyone would have expected from the Messiah. And that's probably why I love this so much. Even on its own, that scene with Shanks would have been a great scene, but then there's a later scene that is really kind of the second part to the story, and it provides the perfect counter to the first part. That same pirate comes back a second time when Shanks and his crew aren't at the bar, and he starts causing trouble again. And Luffy, wanting to stick up for his friend, the barmaid, tries to stand up to the pirate captain, but it just doesn't go well for him because he's still a kid. The captain grabs Luffy and is going to hurt him, but Shanks shows up at just the right time to intervene. Naturally, the captain does not take him seriously because he thinks Shanks is a coward, but then Shanks comes back with this. You can spill a drink on me and I'll let it slide. But don't you ever threaten my friends. And then Shanks and his crew take out all the bad pirates and Shanks rescues Luffy, proving that he is not a coward, quite the opposite actually, but he is a man with enough self-control to know when to engage in violence and when to pursue peace. It really does make Shanks an excellent role model for Luffy, and it explains a lot about how Luffy has ended up such a force for good in the world now that he's grown up. So that's the main reason why Shanks is one of my favorite characters in this show. He's just such a good masculine role model and a great father figure to Luffy. Now, of course, one might argue that he's not that great a father figure since he did end up leaving Luffy behind when he went to search for the One Piece. And I don't know if I'd have any good counter argument to that. But even though he wasn't always there, the lessons that Shanks instilled in Luffy were great, which already puts him above most depictions of fathers in modern media. 
And we get another great example of a masculine role model in Sanji's backstory, where he and Zeph, the old pirate captain who had just attacked his ship, are left stranded on an island with very little food or hope of rescue. Zeph only has two bags of supplies left over from the shipwreck, and he gives the kid, Sanji, a smaller bag of food. Sanji questions why Zeph gets the bigger bag, and he says, because I'm three times your size, and basically just tells the kid to piss off to the other side of the island and not bother him unless there's a ship coming to their rescue. Days and weeks pass and slowly Sanji begins to run low on food and gets resentful until eventually he thinks, screw this, the old man had more food than I did, I'm going to go kill him and take it. So he goes to the other side of the island only to find the old man's big bag of supplies completely untouched. Confused, Sanji opens it to find that it's full of gold and treasure and not food. Zeph never had any food, he gave it all to Sanji. Then Sanji looks back at Zeph, wordlessly asking the question that the entire audience is asking in this moment. How is this man still alive? And the answer? He literally cut off his own leg and ate that because he would rather sacrifice a limb than take food from a starving child. That level of sacrifice is almost incomprehensible, which I guess fits perfectly with the show as a whole since everything in this show is just dialed up to 11. But I just loved that scene and that reveal. Why can't Hollywood give us more storylines about heroic sacrifice like this? And of course, Zeph was far from a perfect father figure to Sanji after they got rescued. The two of them fought constantly, but that just makes the story so much more compelling because even a character as flawed as Zeph was willing to sacrifice his own leg to give the best possible chance of survival to a kid that he literally just met. But it's not just good father figures making sacrifices for their sons. Nami's adoptive mother also gave her life for her daughters and refused to deny them in the face of death. That's how committed she was to loving them and showing them that regardless of bloodlines, they were her daughters just as much as if she had birthed them herself. Now, I do think that her handling of this scene was a bit silly just from a logical perspective, because if she had just lied to Arlong, he probably wouldn't have actually found out for sure about her daughters, which would have meant she could afford to pay the toll and he wouldn't have killed her. But clearly, she felt it was more important to prove her love to her daughters even in the face of death by refusing to deny them. Mom, why didn't you just lie? You didn't have to tell them about it because you are my daughters, and I would never deny that. Nami didn't seem to agree that that was the better option, but even if the sacrifice is a little unneeded, I can't deny that it's heroic. Another scene I wanted to highlight was in Zoro's backstory, a scene I honestly could not believe had somehow been allowed onto a Netflix show when I first saw it, because it just goes so fundamentally against all the Hollywood messaging that Netflix is so known for pushing. Yep, that's right, this show dares to admit that men and women are not the same and women have significant physical disadvantages in a fight against men. How dare they? Isn't that like, sexist or something? Quick, who's the showrunner? We should all pretend to be offended on Twitter to try to cancel them or something. That's what good revolutionaries do, right? Anyway, the scene in question is when Zoro is training as a kid and he keeps getting beaten by a girl who is around his age and is just a better fighter than him. He gets really mad about losing all the time and blames it on the wooden swords, so they face off with real blades instead. And she beats him again, and he is so defeated that he practically begs her to kill him because he doesn't think that he's worthy. Right up until that point, this scene was looking like a feminist daydream. And then, much to my surprise, she comes out with this monologue. Don't be an idiot. You've always had raw skill, and you'll only get better. You'll surpass me in size, strength, and speed, eventually. You'll surpass me in everything. That's dumb. No, that's nature. I'm small now and fast, but soon all the boys will get taller and stronger. Their arms will be longer than mine. Who cares about that kind of stuff? Don't you get it? Girls can beat boys, but no woman can beat a man. I couldn't believe it. I was so shocked by how accurate it was, but more so I was shocked by how based it was. Obviously it's easy for YouTubers like me to talk about things like this without fearing much backlash, but it's a lot more difficult for Hollywood writers to write this kind of thing into their movies and TV shows without getting crucified online for supposed bigotry, because understanding basic biology is apparently evil now. And I would argue that her statement is actually a little bit too extreme, you know, a woman could never beat a man. Generally a woman would have a very hard time beating a man, but I don't love the use of the word never. And sword fighting is one of the few sports where women actually can compete to a similar level to men. Shadowversity has at least one video on the topic, which is excellent. But still, as a general rule, it's pretty much true. The exceptions are just that, exceptions to the more common reality. And this girl is probably intentionally exaggerating in this scene because she's upset at the reality of her future as she grows up from a girl to a woman. She's angry that she's not going to be able to keep competing to such a high standard. She's understandably bitter because all her opponents will outgrow her and end up with tons of natural advantages that she feels she will never be able to overcome. 
So I can forgive her for using the word never and making it seem like such an absolute statement. But what I love most about this scene isn't actually her super based monologue, it's Zoro's reaction to it. Don't say that. Don't make excuses. You're my goal. If you just give up, what has all our training been for? Let's fight every day. We'll keep getting better and stronger until one of us becomes the greatest. He basically says, wow, that sucks, but I would hate to see you use it as an excuse and just give up. Sure, you have disadvantages that we don't have. Who cares? If we train every day, we're both going to get better and better, and you can learn to overcome and work around your natural limitations as best you can. He basically tells her, just because it's going to get harder doesn't mean you should give up, and I absolutely love that. And I love the promise that he makes to her too, that they will train every day until one of them becomes the greatest swordsman or woman in the world. Again, such a wholesome and uplifting message, rather than the victim complex garbage that we so often get from Hollywood these days. The final scene I wanted to touch on is with Nami in the second last episode. Even though she doesn't want to, Nami has betrayed Luffy and the crew to Arlong. She has stolen the map to the Grand Line and she's returned to Arlong's home base because it turns out she was working for him this whole time. And all of Luffy's crew are understandably upset and hurt by her betrayal, but mostly they just accept that she fooled them and that this is who she is deep down. They're willing to just let her go and forget about her, but not Luffy. Luffy is confident that he knows Nami and he's certain she would not do this if she had any other choice. He isn't mad at her, he doesn't want vengeance or even to just turn his back and forget. He's worried about her and he insists that they go after her to get to the bottom of things. His crew keeps saying she's a traitor and he basically says, I need to look her in the eyes and hear it from her mouth before I can accept that it's true. And he's right, Nami does have her reasons and she didn't want to betray them. She's got a deal with Arlong, if she can pay back 100 million berry, he will let her village go. She went to work for him, drawing maps of the seas after her mother died. And then after she made that deal, she became a thief. Not for her own personal gain or anything like that, she steals only to get funds to buy her village's freedom from the evil pirate crew. And somehow she's got the money now, I mean she must have been doing a hell of a lot of thievery. And she's ready to pay back Arlong and secure her freedom, her sisters, and her hometowns. But Arlong crosses her and sends a corrupt marine to seize her money and treasure. Then he attacks her village and burns it to the ground. Distraught and at a loss for what to do, she breaks down, even resorting to self-harm to try to cut out her swordfish tattoo. Then Luffy shows up and stops her from hurting herself any further. And initially she's still a little too proud to accept his help, but then she finally does accept that she's out of her depth and she needs her crew. The same crew that she always insisted that she was not a part of. And so she swallows her pride and says, Luffy. And Luffy's response is so simple, but so powerful. Of course I will. He doesn't hesitate, he doesn't wait to consider how this might benefit him. He doesn't even try to make things difficult for her or give her a hard time for betraying them. He simply forgives her immediately and comes to her aid without question. Because she's his friend and she needs his help. And given what we know about Luffy based on the other episodes, he would have probably been just as willing to risk his life to help her even if she wasn't his friend, if she was just a total stranger who needed help and had nobody else to turn to. Because that's how men should be. They should step up and protect those who cannot protect themselves. Shanks did an excellent job of teaching Luffy what it means to be a good man, and I just love this scene and this show so much because of all of that. There's plenty more excellent parts of this show that I could go on about for hours, but this video is already long enough and I feel like I've addressed the majority of the parts that were really, you know, that really stood out to me about this show, so I'll leave it there. I cannot recommend this show enough. It's easily my favourite show of the year, at least as far as I can remember off the top of my head, and I cannot wait for season two. In the meantime, I might have to give the anime a go, which is perhaps the greatest testament to how much I love this show, because with a few exceptions, I typically do not enjoy anime. I don't know what it is specifically that I don't like about it, I don't really have time to dive into the topic right now anyway, but I just find anime is typically hard for me to get into. And yet this show has me so hooked on this story, these characters in this world, which is why I'm willing to step out of my usual comfort zone and try the anime too. And how insanely uncommon is that? A TV adaptation of a beloved franchise that actually leaves the audience excited to check out the source material instead of turning the audience off the franchise as a whole. So those are my thoughts on One Piece, the Netflix version. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below, like the video if you want to, subscribe at your own risk, and until next time, keep your pen on the paper and your sword in the scabbard.